there it is, 7 o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and open our Bible study this evening with prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to study your word once more. God, I pray that you will clarify things for us as we take this 12-week journey through Jeremiah. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you for everyone viewing, everyone on the conference call line. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. So glad that you are here. We're going to uh, go ahead and transition from the minor prophets to the major prophets. So if you've been with me this entire uh, time, um, then you know that, well, at the entire time that we've been doing Facebook videos and everything like that, then you've had the opportunity to see that we have gone through um, the minor prophets. We've been doing our Bible study since 2011, so I had to make sure that I clarified what I meant when I said if you've been with me the entire time. Um, of course, some people have been, so thank you. We've been journeying through Scripture since 2011 together, and so we're not going to change it because it's 2020, um, but we now are doing uh, videos, and so you can catch these videos on Facebook Live and also on YouTube. I need to say that I have a YouTube channel. If you did not get to walk with us through the Minor Prophets, then please know some of the videos are available on YouTube. All of them are on Facebook, on my public figure page. So on today, we're going to start with Jeremiah. Why did I start with the major prophet Jeremiah instead of Isaiah? I mean, after all, um, Jeremiah's prophecy is two centuries after Isaiah's. And then Jeremiah ministered for at least four decades. But why did I choose Jeremiah first instead of Isaiah? Well, when you consider what's going on in our lives, I'm saying everybody, no matter where you come from, no matter where you live, um, you know that we are dealing with some things now in 2020 that may cause loneliness, may cause sorrow, may cause suffering. A lot of us are suffering right now. We're facing so many things. And I can tell you that as much as we might like to avoid those three things, loneliness, suffering, and sorrow, life delivers them to us. And so... Jeremiah was that weeping prophet who wrestled with those deep emotions. And so since it is a season right now of sorrow, a season of loneliness and suffering, I figure we should start with Jeremiah. And I see Brother Jeremy on Facebook says, you're starting with, uh, with Jeremiah because I was named after him. I'm so glad you said that. Yes. We know that many names are derived from others, and Jeremy is definitely linked to Jeremiah. I'm glad you said that. I actually thought about you today in my study. So glad that you're here. So really, Jeremiah is a book of tragedy. Um, it's about this unraveling nation that um, is declining because God's people are failing to follow in the way of God. Now we've seen and heard the same message when we consider the minor prophets that we study. But again, this is a major prophet, not because Jeremiah's message is any more important or valid than the minor prophets. It just simply means that his prophecy, his book is longer. And so, like we said before, uh, once we start studying these uh, major prophets, it's going to take us a few more weeks where when we were studying the minor prophets, we were able to complete a prophet per Thursday. So we're going to have to stay in Jeremiah and need to stay in Jeremiah. And really, we get to stay in Jeremiah for the next 12 weeks. Now, the 12th week, I will go over Lamentations because um, that's the title of his second book is Lamentations. And it echoes Jeremiah's familiarity with sorrow, um, loneliness and suffering. So by studying this weeping prophet, he's known as the weeping prophet, um, we're going to see how we can still remain faithful to God even when we have to cry. And I just believe that right now is a crying season. And I know that many times we don't want to face that type of emotion or even let people see tears roll down our face because after infanthood, you're taught, especially if you're a man, suck it up. You know, 
crybaby, right? Um, crocodile tears, right? Um, so we really um, have to consider this, these emotions because you're feeling them or you will feel them or you know someone who's feeling them. So here's Jeremiah. His contemporaries are Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So contemporary, as we said before, just simply means that they were prophesying at the same time. So Jeremiah is a young man when God calls him to prophesy. So on this evening, um, we're going to break, like I said, these studies up in 12, uh, 12 comprehensive studies. So each study will have a title so that if you miss a, a, a Thursday, then you can go back and now since we're doing videos, you can go back and watch the video, okay? So if you miss a Thursday, it's okay because we're going to stick to Jeremiah and you'll know where we are, okay? So on this evening, we're going to focus on Jeremiah chapters 1 to 4. So we're going to go through this, I don't want to say quickly, um, because I want to be respectful to scripture. I just need to say we're going to go through it enough so that we can journey through 12 weeks. So we've got 12 weeks and um, we're going to look at Jeremiah the entire time. OK, so he's the weeping prophet. So um, when considering Jeremiah chapters one to four, it, they talk about uh, the prophet's call and the prophet's message. So this is an introductory uh, type uh, Bible study on this evening, and we'll get to see exactly what his call looks like, and we'll get to see some of the message. So his message is to Judah. Now, let me say this to us. I've been talking about Judah, Israel, Jerusalem, and I don't know about you, but geography sometimes can get me confused. So I had to be sure to go back and review some of this so that as we're talking about this, you and I both understand who he's prophesying to. What does it mean when you hear Israel and Judah? I mean, has anybody ever gotten confused about that? I can honestly say, um, even in seminary, I had to go through trying to um, understand geography as the Bible is saying that the person went here and they prophesied to this and this and that. Okay. So please understand that after the death of King Solomon, the kingdom was split. And some of you may already know this, but just for the purpose of us being on the same page, please know that after the death of King Solomon, the kingdom was split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom retained the name Israel. So here's Israel up here, right? Okay, then the southern kingdom is called Judah. And Jerusalem, for as long as it stood, was the capital of the kingdom of Judah. Okay, so when we read the Bible and we see that it seems interchangeably Jerusalem, Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, just know that the southern kingdom is called Judah and its capital for as long as it stood is Jerusalem. And then Israel is uh, is at the top, is northern. Okay, I just thought I'd throw that out there. You may already know that, but since it's Bible study, we want to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, so I, I, I just wanted to say that. So then, who is Jeremiah prophesying to? He's proper, prophesying primarily to the nation of Judah, whose capital is what? Jerusalem. But then he's also prophesying to surrounding nations. So Jeremiah's message to Judah was that of, of condemnation because the people were practicing idolatry. Um, there was, uh, there was uh, social injustice going on. And so Jeremiah was to speak out against that type of activity. Now his name means God exalts or God will raise. Which is, I found very interesting because of so many things that Jeremiah had to face. Now, we're going to be with Jeremiah for the next 12 weeks, so we'll continue to unpack this. But his name means God exalts. But Jeremiah, throughout his lifetime, guess what? He was poor. Hmm. Jeremiah, throughout his lifetime, he was thrown in prison. 
but his name means God exalts. He was thrown into a well. He was taken to Egypt. Uh, you know, he didn't want to go, but he was taken there. Um, he was rejected by his neighbors. He re was rejected by family. He was rejected by friends. He was rejected by uh, priests. He was rejected by the kings. He was rejected by his audience. Yet and still, his name meant God exalts. God will raise. Isn't that something? So throughout his life, he stood alone. He's declaring God's message of doom, you know, announcing a new covenant. And he's weeping over the fate of his nation. So one of the things I really respect about Je Jeremiah was that he was a man who wasn't afraid to cry. He was a man who wept. And it's unfortunate that in our society today, we sometimes liken a man's tears unto weakness. And that's why I'm glad that we're studying Jeremiah because Jeremiah was a man who was in tune with his emotions. All of these negative things was happening to his nation and he felt it. But his life was considered a miserable failure if we were to judge his life by social, you know, by what we think socially success is. His life was a miserable failure because he served God as a spokesman to Judah and the people didn't listen. You know, we would think if people aren't listening to you, then you're not a success. Like if I start to uh, judge these Bible studies by how many viewers come on, you know, if I only have, I don't know, nine people on here, then I must be a failure. Because according to society standards, I should have the kind of views that, you know, um, maybe some entertainer, you know, should have. You see, that's the way we measure success. So since nobody was listening to him, one might say that he was a miserable failure. Not to mention that when he spoke, nobody moved. Nobody did anything. If you are a preacher out there, if you're a pastor and you are preaching to your congregation about the same thing over and over again and nobody moves, then by society standard, you would be considered, just like Jeremiah, a miserable failure. Not to mention that he was poor, like I said. So if you're doing God's work and you're poor, hmm, I thought God was supposed to bless his people. Jeremiah, miserable failure. So as we journey through Jeremiah's prophecy, I want us to be sure that we just think about this man, the human side of him, not just the spiritual call that he has and the fact that he's a man of God, but the fact that he's a man. Because I think that many of us in this season need to remember that we are human. And all of this talk, I mean, I understand, yes, you need to be, be as strong as you need to be to get through this and get through that. It's just, if you're so strong, why is it that you need God? For what reason do you really need God unless you have weak moments? So, so we're going to see these themes in, in, in Jeremiah. You know, we're going to see how God's heart is grieved because humanity is disobedient, but we're also going to see how Jeremiah's heart is grieved because of the disobedience. Um, we're going to see sin. We're going to see weeping. We're going to see uh, Jeremiah's responsibility for proclaiming judgment for these people's wickedness. Um, and we're going to see Jeremiah is weeping for the nation, but he also weeps for his own persecution. Sometimes you just need a good cry. And I hope as we journey through Jeremiah, you'll give yourself permission to feel whatever it is you need to feel. I'm not going to talk you out of your emotions, okay? That's not going to happen, especially as we look at Jeremiah. So, Let's go ahead and look at chapter one. So we're going to go through, uh, like I said, four chapters. Okay, let's go. If you have your Bible open, Jeremiah chapter one. What we're going to see here is the call. So we're talking about the prophet's call and we're talking about the, uh, the message. Okay, the prophet's calling and the message. So if we look at Jeremiah chapter one, he starts talking about uh, or starts talking about who Jeremiah is, who he's the son of, right? 
um, talks about who the king is at that time. Um, that's chapter verses one, two, and three. Well, when you get to chapter or verse four, Jeremiah chapter one, verse four, that's when we see Jeremiah's calling. So let's read that. It says, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, before I formed thee in the belly, and I'm reading King James Version, whatever version you have is fine. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. That's the call right there. That's God calling Jeremiah. And it's a pretty clear call. I already knew. And if God has told you something, and you know that it's clear, you have to always remember what the Lord said in the first place, in the beginning. No matter what happens in Jeremiah's life from here on out, this is the call. This is what God said, and this is what I, Jeremiah, must walk in. So that's the call. Okay? Well, Jeremiah has a conversation with the Lord. Because sometimes, right, God says something, but I have some questions, right? Sometimes God says something, but I don't always understand. So I have, a, okay, clarifying uh, comment, God. Um, Lord, I cannot speak, for I am a child. That's Jeremiah, right? Okay, so then the Lord comes back in verse 7 and says, Don't say I'm a child, for thou uh, shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Don't be afraid of their faces. Okay, so God is telling Jeremiah this because it is said that Jeremiah was a man of about 20 years old. So some of us may be 20. If you're not 20, I want you to remember when you were 20. Right. Sometimes when we're right 20, there are some things that we may not be certain of. And then we have to stand before other people who are older than us. And so he's saying, ah. and so then God is saying in verse eight, don't be afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then God says, uh, then it says, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. So God says something in Jeremiah's ears, and then God does something to Jeremiah's mouth. So don't be afraid of their faces. You're 20 years old, and you're going to be speaking out to people who are probably old enough to be your, your parent or, and or your grandparent. Then you're going to speak out to people who may be your peers. So you all know what it was like if you're not 20 now. You know what it was like to be 20. Perhaps you had words to say that were valid, but people didn't listen to you because you're young, right? Remember how you were treated when you were younger? You didn't know anything. But the fact is you knew what you knew because you were 20 in whatever year and they weren't. So you at least knew what it was like to be 20. You were an expert on that, but they didn't give you any credit because you were so young. So God is saying to Jeremiah, even when you see their faces, don't worry about that. And not to mention when you were 20, Let's say your contemporaries, people who are your same age, you know, maybe they're thinking, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> oh, man, whatever. We're all 20 here, you know. But then God gave you a pinch of wisdom that they didn't have, but you really couldn't say that because you're 20. So then you really didn't fit anywhere. You were too young to be wise and too old to just have fun with life, right? Because God had a call on your life. That's what I think about when I think about Jeremiah. Some of us may have experienced that, right? So God touches his mouth. Look at that. And the Lord said, behold, I have put my words in your mouth, right? And I'm so grateful when I read that. God has put words in your mouth. Now, the question is, what words do we choose to use? If God is able to put words in our mouth, then that means we have to choose the words that God would choose and not the words that our emotions sometimes would choose, right? So that's a good prayer, right, for us. Lord, let me use the words that you put in my mouth, <laughs> not the ones that maybe I come up with that aren't appropriate or that I just don't need to say. And let me be quiet when I need to be quiet because silence cannot be misquoted. So then... God gives Jeremiah a job description. So we're talking about the prophet's call. That's the wonderful thing about God. When God gives you a call, God gives you a job description. That's why you never have to uh, fight 
for, for whatever call or position God gives you. Because God gives you a sure call. That's what he did with Jeremiah. And then God gives you clarity on what the description is. This is what I need you to do, Jeremiah. He gives Jeremiah six tasks. So if you have your Bible open, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, he gives Jeremiah six tasks. Let's see if you can see them in there. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. Okay, this is the job description. Now, there have been other prophets, Jeremiah, but this is what you are to do. I've had other people doing it. This is what I need you to do. Okay, see, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to, here we go, number one, to root out, number two, and to pull down, number three, and to destroy, number four, and to throw down, number five, to build, number six, and to plant. That's it. Now, Jeremiah would need to remember this job description. Because when he got out there and started to do the work of the Lord, there are so many distractions that might try to get him to do other things. But God gave him six things, six descriptive things that he could focus on when he got out there. And that's good, I think, even for us to see and to know is that when God gives a call, God gives the description. So then there is no misunderstanding. And no one can sway you from the, that description. So if we're still in chapter one, we're still in chapter one. So let's look at uh, verse 13. I only want to show that because it's a picture of danger that's coming from the north. So God uh, says to Jeremiah, what do you see? So remember, God shows prophets these visions and, and images, and, and then there are word pictures. So I just want to uh, show that, you know, bring that up just a little bit. Um, verse 13, and the word of the Lord came unto me a second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is, to is, is toward the north. So this is a picture of danger that's coming toward Judah. So we won't be able to look at every uh, type of image or vision per se um, that Jeremiah has. You're going to have to study, you know, even more in depth on your own time because we're going to go again 12 weeks. Um, so but but I do want to, as we journey, show some of those things and talk about what it means. OK, so. That is the Lord showing Jeremiah that danger is coming to these people because of their disobedience. So I just wanted to bring that out. And also in chapter one, before we move on to chapter two, um, I wanted us to look at verses 17, 18 and 19, because this is the type of encouragement that Jeremiah would need. And these are the things that he would need to remember for his mental, emotional, and spiritual health. I'm bringing this up because sometimes as Christians, we focus a lot on spiritual health, but we don't always focus on mental and emotional health. So let me touch on that a little bit. Look at verses 17, 18, and 19. Because what God is doing is he's saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you will be invincible. God says, uh, thou therefore, God says, gird up thy loins and rise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces. He says that again, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brass and walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So Jeremiah is about to go into some stuff. Right. His ministry is not about to be easy. I mean, God is saying, look, uh, they're going to fight against you. Look at that. Would you uh, accept a ministry like that? 
<laughs> they're going to fight against you, but they won't prevail. I'm with you. So that's the encouragement that Jeremiah would need mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And the fact is, we're going to journey through Jeremiah again because I, I know that we are in a season. I just feel that speaking to my heart. We are in a season of sorrow. We are in a season of loneliness. We are in a season of pain. And somebody needs to be encouraged just as God encouraged Jeremiah because we're going to be here for a little while. We're going to be here for a little while, okay? This is where we are going to be. And so mental, emotional, and spiritual health is found in the fact that there are going to be some more things to fight against us in 2020, okay? Yet, they will not prevail against us. So we have to keep living out 2020 and see about 2021. So please be preparing yourself to strengthen your mind, to strengthen yourself emotionally, and to strengthen yourself spiritually. Okay. You just spoke a mouthful of this because you said, and I don't even know if you realize what you just said, you said we have to be prepared and continue to keep living it out. And that is, you know, a big part of it. We have to keep living it out. I have been speaking to people and having to encourage them that we have to continue to, you know, live it out. We have to not just be um, alive. You know, we have to live. We have to live in this experience. We cannot sit still in it. We have to actually live in it. And although, like you're teaching us tonight, and we'll continue, you know, to but we, it is thoughtful. There is death all around us. And, you know, there is a lot of grief and pain and sorrow and heartache, and we are experiencing a lot of family members that, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately have to succumb to COVID-19. There are family members, people we love, who are unfortunately being diagnosed with it in addition to other, you know, variables and everything else, you know, that we live with day to day without COVID-19 existence. We have to fight family. We have to fight. We have to fight to live. We have to show God that no matter what is going on, we are going to trust him and he is bigger than whatever is going on. And we are going to continue to live, like you just said. That just spoke to me when you said that because I know some people that are really hurting right now. And I'm hurting for their hurt. I'm hurting for your hurt. I'm hurting for you. Whoever you are out there, my brother, my sister, I'm hurting for your hurt. I'm hurting for my hurt. But we have to stay connected. This is a collective. This is a collective in the body of Christ. And we have to keep living. And we have to keep working through this. And we have to trust God no matter what. That's right. That's right. That's right. So you cry. You get knocked down, you cry, you get knocked down, you cry, you, you get up and you live. And our Bible study through Jeremiah is going to be a mental, emotional, and spiritual uh, type of brother and sisterhood where we're going to fall and get up, cry and get up. And so that's what this is about because it's not letting up right now. So I know people are saying, well, after a while we're going to get back in church and after a while it... I hear you, um, and again, you're going to be where you are right now, okay? We are here, and we're going to be right here, okay? So rather than trying to work on getting out, we're going to work on how to maneuver, how to be in it, how to sit in the pain, how to sit in the sorrow, how to express what we're feeling. Because I know in the African-American community, many times we don't do that. So in this space, if you join this Bible study, then that's exactly what we're going to do, okay? You can call it counseling, you can call it whatever you want, but we're going to allow the Word of God to let us be human so that the power of God can give us strength. So thank you for your words. Yes, indeed. So chapter 2, if you have your Bible open, let's go to chapter 2. I am only going to bring out a few things. I wanted to um, remember I mentioned how the people were being disobedient to God. Well, we need to make sure that what I'm saying is actually true. And I'm not just saying that, but we see it in the word of God. This is Bible study, not McCoy study. So 
What were the people doing? I wanted to give us some, some examples here in chapter 2, okay? Um, if you look at Jeremiah chapter 2, let's look at verse 8. Um, what were the priests doing? Let's see. Um, uh, verse 8 says, The priests said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So the ministry of the priests and the pastors was dead. It was ritual instead of a living relationship. It was ritual instead of a living relationship. So God was not pleased with the priests and and uh, the pastors. And it clearly says that in verse 8. Okay. Then if you go down to verse 13. It says for my people have committed two evils. So here's another example of what the people were doing. They have forsaken me. The fountain of living waters. And hewed them out cisterns. Broken cisterns. That can hold no water. So. In the Bible day, well, not just the Bible day, even now, but a, but a cistern was something that held water. And even the best cisterns could be cracked and they would not hold anything. So what the Bible is saying here is that the people have become so broken that they don't hold the living word or the living water, it says, of God. You're not holding anything. So that's one of the evils as well. So they forsaken God and it, they are broken. So they were in need of repair that could only happen through following God, through obedience to God. So you're a broken sister. And so that, that's another thing. And then if you look at verse 34, remember I mentioned social injustice. So let's see that. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 34 also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor, the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. So here it's talking about the murder and the social injustice that's seen among the people. And so the people are, again, being disobedient in so many ways and they're living the way that they want. So I wanted to bring those things out because chapter two is about the people forsaking God. So I just wanted to bring out a few ways that they were doing that. Well, by the time we get to chapter three, we see imagery here where the Bible is speaking as a, a nation that is adulterous. It's speaking as a marriage, if you will, as God being the husband to Judah and Judah committing adultery. Right there in chapter 3, starting at the very beginning, verse 1, it says, They say, if a man put away his wife and she shall go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. So remember, we've talked before about this uh, imagery in the Bible that sometimes speaks to a like a marriage. And even uh, when we get to chapter three, verse 14, it says, turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. So see, there it is again, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one from a city and two of a family and I will bring you uh, to Zion. So if we look even at verse 14, we see that divine call and we see that relationship talk, if you will. Right. And so but the interesting thing about verse 14 that I saw was that it's a divine call. What God is saying, turn uh, turn backsliding children, say of the Lord, I'm married unto you. So it's a free invitation. It's a divine call of God. But then it shows divine election. It shows divine election because God's choosing. He's choosing um, these people. 
So he has a call, but then he stands behind the call when he says, I will take you one of a city and two of a family and I will bring you to Zion. So it's a free offer of the gospel that God offers, right? So we see it. We can connect this to the New Testament in the sense that uh, Jesus gives the invitation, right? Um, repent. The kingdom of the Lord is at hand. This invitation is given to children, to men, to women, to everyone. So there's that call to Jesus Christ. And then that divine uh, election again is God's choice. God's choosing stands behind God's call. So God had called um, Jeremiah and then God stands behind the fact that he chose Jeremiah by saying, I'm going to make you invincible. Does not mean that you're not going to cry. That's not what I said. <laughs> Does not mean that everyone's going to like you. That's not what I said. I said that I will stand behind you. I will stand. I will make sure that you're not utterly destroyed and that the way that people may think that you are not a success, you're a success in my eyes. As long as you do those six things that I called you to do, Jeremiah. So I like that about chapter three because it shows us the divine call and divine election. And I see Sister Philip says, just like the world in 2020. Oh, yes, I know much of what we are reading now about uh, the way that people were in Jeremiah's day with this social injustice, uh, even murder, um, the, the evils. Um, and then another thing I would throw in there is that... Um, Many times we we put people like like me, like ministers, you know, we put people like me in these lofty places. Um, but what I like about the Bible here is that you can clearly see that priests, you know, um, the so-called holy people in Jeremiah's day and the pastors, you know, when we read Jeremiah chapter two, verse eight. Their ministry was dead. It was about rituals instead of a living relationship. So we have to be careful. Don't put me in some lofty place. D don't, don't do that. I mean, you have to be very careful about that. We're not talking about not respecting those who are called of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that corruption has been around for a long time. Okay? And your trust should be in God. You should love and pray for human beings. Okay? So if, if you hear something about me, I go out here and do something, you know, crazy like, um, I'm not going to say shoot anything up. But I mean, if I go out here and do something, you know, crazy or whatever, you need to go back to Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 8 and not be surprised that there have been people who were called by God who did some things that weren't pleasing to God. And even now, I can tell you, I don't do everything right. I am not a perfect person. The reason why I do these, these Bible studies and things is because I need the Word of God to get through life and to be a better person. I don't do it because I have arrived at some place and I need to tell you people how to get to where I am. That's not what this is about. So what I'm trying to do is not be like the priests and the pastors in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 8, <laughs> right? Right. So we all need Jesus, right? We all need a little more Jesus. So let's go to our uh, last chapter for this evening. As we look at chapter 4, I want us to, so we talked about the behaviors of the people because I did mention that, right? So, so I wanted to make sure that we saw that in scripture and I wasn't just saying that. Now let's look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 4 um, because I want us to really um, look at what God is saying to the people, what they need to do. So whenever we need to get ourselves in order, we can look to the word of God to see how to do that. So God is giving clear instructions, people. He's saying to Judah, look at, uh, at uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. Jeremiah says, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, 
And what did I say about Judah and Jerusalem? I said that uh, Judah is the southern kingdom and Jerusalem was its capital for as long as it stood. So uh, Jeremiah is talking to the southern kingdom and the capital of that kingdom, which is Jerusalem. All right, we got it. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. That's instruction right there. Well, what does that mean? Well, what God is saying to the people is break up uh, your neglected and untilled hearts. Your heart is neglecting me. It's untilled. It's like um, it's like your heart has become like an uncultivated field. So it needs the plow of repentance. It needs the plow of obedience. It needs to be changed. Your heart is far from me. So that's what God is saying to these people. Break up your fallow ground, your, your uncultivated hard ground, and don't sow thorns. And then he says in, in verse 4, Jeremiah says to the people, speaking for God, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Yes, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. So it was as if they had this hard incrustation on their hearts and it needed to be cut away. That's what that means. And obstacles needed to be removed to the point where they could follow the will of God. So whatever is making your heart hard toward me needs to be cut away just cut it off cut it off whatever is taking you away from me whatever is an obstacle i need you to change your heart so then in verse 10 we see jeremiah we see the first of many glimpses of his troubled mind because he says then said i ah lord Surely thou hast greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying ye shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. So throughout this book, we're going to see how God talks to Jeremiah. So, and sometimes, let me say this, it's going to be a bit, uh, a bit, uh, hmm, I won't say confusing, but, but we might struggle a little bit to understand, is God talking or is Jeremiah talking right there? Um, is Jeremiah talking to God? Where is God? Is Jeremiah talking to the people? <laughs> so just know that we're going to get through those things together. Like, for example, if you look at um, Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 19, really to the end of the chapter, 31. We don't have to read all of that on our Bible study line, but when we hang up, maybe you might want to read Jeremiah chapter 4 verses 19 to 31 and you'll see what I mean. Jeremiah, I mean, it's hard to, to uh, really decipher between the suffering of Jeremiah and the suffering of God. They're so closely linked that it's hard to sort out who's speaking what in Jeremiah uh, 4, 19 to 31. I mean, it's like a it's like a lament. And so you're reading it and you're thinking, is Jeremiah lamenting there or is God lamenting there? Because God is hurt over the people's disobedience. And then Jeremiah is weeping over his nation because they're disobedient. So perhaps you'll read that and see. But I want to look at chapter four, verse 27, because it shows us both God's wrath and God's mercy. Before I read that, I see Dr. Berry says here on the Facebook line, because we don't physically bow down to statues, we don't realize that anything, even good things, can become an idol. Uh huh. Like, for example, she says a spouse, children, job, etc. That's right. That is so true. Anything can become an idol. That is absolutely true. Anything that takes us away, you know, from God. We have to ask ourselves if we're idolizing it. That's great. Great point. That's so true. That's so true. So uh, verse uh, 27. 
Thank you, Dr. Barry. Verse 27, God's wrath and mercy in one verse. Look at that. In one verse. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Isn't that interesting? In one verse, we read of God's wrath and we read of God's mercy. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet, that's wrath, the whole land shall be de desolate, yet, yet, Will I not make a full end? So we can reflect here on God's intense commitment to us. God takes discipline, you know, the discipline of humanity seriously. And then God also takes, um, so, so God is going to discipline us. God takes wrath seriously. And then God takes mercy seriously. Because God wants to complete the work of grace that he has begun. So in the beginning, God created us in a way to which we would worship and praise him and, you know, just for eternity. And then there was the fall. So then God is creating all of these different ways by which to reconcile humanity unto himself. And so then we see wrath because God is like, no, no, no. You know, I'm going to allow this to happen because I'm trying to get you all back to where I need you to be. And I'm not going to utterly destroy you because I love you so much that, that, that I'm just going to give you another chance. So, so I want to stop right there. I, I want to end on that note. God's commitment to humanity. By the time we get to chapter 4, this is what we see is that even in the midst of all of the disobedience and God allowing this to happen and that to happen, God still says and reaches out to humanity to say, I will not make a full end. So God is still saying, I will not make a full end. How do I know that? Because babies are still being born. I will not make a full end. God is still saying, I will not make a full end. How do I know that? Because God gave us another Thursday to study his word together. God is still saying, I will not make a full end. How do I know? Because I was diagnosed with coronavirus and was asymptomatic. And I'm not on a ventilator. So that tells me, even in my own life, as I sit here today, God is saying, I will not make a full end. So my brothers and sisters, we will have to go through some more things in 2020. And we will feel the wrath of God, just as people in the Bible day did. And then there is mercy. So I don't know how you feel about it, but I thank God for God's grace and mercy. So, oh, and Brother, McD Brother Malcolm Dowdle, I hope I didn't say your name wrong. Brother Malcolm, God bless you. You say thank God for his mercy. That's right. That's a good way to end right there. Thank God for his mercy. Yes, praise God, Sister Clemens. So I thank God for all of you being here on this evening. We're going to stick with Jeremiah, okay? And so on next week, we're going to try and get through Jeremiah's chapters 5 to 10. Now, I know that's a lot. Um, to try and get through, but it's the message of judgment intensified. So I really want to, uh, you know, get us through that on next week. So some of it will be abbreviated for the fact for just for the fact that we don't have all night. But I hope that these Bible studies are encouraging you to read your Bible more. Hopefully, as we, you know, um, peruse through the chapters, You'll go back and you'll read them if you haven't read them before. Or even if you read them, go back and read them. And maybe you'll approach it with a, new, um, with a new clarity. Not because of me, but because God is blessing us together to study. And God is going to show us something that we've never seen before. Okay? All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word again together. Lord, thank you for strength. Thank you for health, God. 
You've been so good to us. Lord, may we continue to serve you. May we continue to pray for one another, God. Even as we go through moments of sorrow, moments of pain, moments of loneliness, God, remind us that you're there for us. We love you, God. And I pray for every family represented even on this evening. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Yes, Dr. Berry, his compassion fails not. And Sister Durham, you're right. God is so good. So God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Thank you for being here on this evening. If it be God's will, we will be back on next Thursday. God bless you. Have a great night.